Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Nightfall in Deptford, Crescent Moon Chronicles number four by L. E. Town, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. An obscure but relevant legend. One or two millennia past, the universe's universe watched as gods and kings and monsters squabbled like siblings on a Saturday morning. The eldest of these so-called gods, the maker of worlds, grew tired of always being the responsible one, and so he assigned his younger sibling a task. To create something, a thing, he said, a world, a craft, a magical machine, where things past slip into things present and things present leap into things future. The younger was not pleased with this as he was infinitely busy doing what younger siblings do, mostly devising ways to be annoying to their elders. For this tale, we shall say the younger was busy falling in love with a human girl named Hespitha. Still, he made a half-hearted attempt to do what was asked, devoting a bit of himself here and there and making time. Literally, for time did not exist prior to this meager effort. He did a rather shoppy job of it. His elders discovered the fabric of time had many holes and snags and spaces to get lost in. They decided to punish the younger by making the human girl Hespathia a goddess and unattainable, keeping her close enough to see but not touch. Close enough that he could not never forget her. What the elder gods didn't count on was that Hespathia had also fallen in love with the youngest of gods, who, despite his sloppy work ethic and dereliction of duty, was quite handsome and not a not inconsiderate lover. To redeem her love in the eyes of his elders, Hespathia chose three human families and bestowed gifts upon them. She knew, having been human herself once, that no creature would be more stubborn and long-lasting than they. No one could do more with less than humans could. She gave one family the power of travel, to move through the ages to repair the holes, the snags, and the spaces in time. Another family would aid this effort by seeing all the glitches and knowing where and when to send a traveler. The third family was assigned the role and longevity of guardianship. They could help both traveler and seer with weapons, skills, and knowledge. The universe evolved as time marched, stars died, and worlds became. The gifted families did their jobs well. Stories were created and added to, added to and taken from and told and retold and written down and spoken aloud. The families became legend, the sword and the charm, the protectors of both. Then a human built a boat, and the legend traveled. The families split apart and moved across the globe. As the universe watched, the world became smaller, and soon, possibly yesterday or the day before, planes and rockets made the world very small, and airwaves allowed everyone to know everything instantly. The protectors stepped up and closed ranks, and the legend was thrust into secrecy known only to those who understood the oddity of gods and the kings and monsters. As they traveled through the human genome, the once powerful gifts waned against the force of ordinary. Once in a great while, the perfect alignment of stars and a blood and magic recombined to manifest a person known as the sword of legend and a person known as the charm of legend and sometimes they were siblings what of the younger and hespathia the elders forgave their sibling and he reunited with his goddess they still exist but as humans have outgrown and forgotten them they live as stardust flying and playing and loving each other while the universe watches chapter one 17 May 1593. Outside the small village of Hackney and well outside London city walls, a burst of blue light erupted across the sky, piercing the sodden grass of an empty paddock. The light receded into the horizon, leaving nothing but rolling hills and scrub oak. A figure materialized, tumbling and rolling before finding his feet. He crouched in the darkness and his body tense and alert. His voluminous cape smoked at the edges as he stood upright, drawing it around him coughing, he's clutched his wounded side. Ah, cold rain and muddy ground, Christopher Barlow spoke into the night. Must be summer in England. He sighed and crossed the paddock with careful steps. Isabel, are you here perchance? He called out, but he detected only the sound of rain pelting leaves of low scrub brush. He climbed a small hill and turned full circle, spotting a faint glow outlining the northern hillside, the lights of London. I hope you have returned to your own time, dear lady. His shoulders dro drooped and he winced as he pulled the leather tunic away from his wound. The gash along his flank would heal, but it was painful. Not knowing Isabel's fate disturbed him, but it was not much preferred to their imminent death at the hands of the ancients. He'd made many a narrow escape in his travels, but usually alone. 
Isabel was his love's sister, and he'd grown quite fond of her over the course of his visits to the modern world. Being responsible for another was troublesome. He and Isabel had gone through a portal in search of the ultimate clue, a talisman, a line of text, something that would allow him control of his own destiny. Tired of being flung across the decades at the whim of the crescent moon, he wished for a solution, not only for his future, but Tamberlin's. Tamberlin Paradiso was the love of his life, and like him, she was also destined to travel the ribbons of time. Turning at a crossroads toward Shore, Shore Dyke Road, he noticed some movement behind the trees. He was still some distance from the city walls, and there were a few big buildings, livestock barns, and shed, sheds dotting the dark landscape. Clouds parted on the crescent moon, and he slowed his pace, pretending to stomp the mud from his boots. He edged his cape back and drew his sword. Grim from the side scabbard, his steps silent on the wet grass. Nearing a dilapidated barn, he kept to the shadows. At one corner, a lantern weaved back and forth, casting a feeble light onto the dirt. A hundred yards away, half obscured by a strand of beech trees, candles lit a mullioned window of a lone farmhouse. A shadow moved into his path. It hissed, then it struck. Blackness swallowed Marlow and he choked, its tendrils searing his nose and throat. The smoke became tangible, holding him with a strength he couldn't fathom, squeezing his ribs, choking his breath from his lungs. Sparks scattered behind his eyes. He rolled on the ground, grappling with a creature that was both smoke and muscle, and nothing like he'd encountered before. Together, they hit the edge of the building, crashing through rotted wood, and he ducked free of the oily dark. Scrambling to his feet, he swung, feet, he swung grim in his downward arc, the blade gliding through the form. Only the hood cut away, revealing a wispy blackness and yellowed glints of eyes. He slipped in the mud, his free hand gripping the wooden slats to right himself. Clearing the fog from his head with a shake, he regripped his sword with both hands and swung the heavy blade overhead, bisecting his enemy. The blackness dissipated. He fell to his knees, gasping for, air, for breath. The entity gathered in front of him, reassembling itself to form a figure. Marlowe found a horse blanket near the open door and flung it over the smoke, trapping the creature inside the damp wool. With the tip of his sword, he edged the lantern off its hook, smashing it onto the writhing blanket. A low hiss sounded from within the flames. It took only a few minutes for the flames to die out, and Marlowe stomped on the ash and burnt fabric. The creature was gone. After making a careful check for stray embers and shadow remnants, he stepped back out onto the road. Any more demons come to attack? Come meet your fate, he said softly, brandishing the sword once before sheathing it. Assured he was alone again, he made haste for town. Within the hour, he entered London proper through Bishop's Gate. The streets were somberly empty and quiet. Even the taverns were hushed, their patrons having stumbled off hours before. Yet the delicious aroma of roasted boar still hovered around, hovered outside the pub's darkened windows. His walk had been long, his spike of energy during the fight had waned, and he looked forward to a warm fire, mulled wine, and a bed. A meal wouldn't hurt either. Plentiful food and hours of battle training had turned his usually wiry frame into hard, broad muscle, but he hadn't eaten in almost three days, and his belly complained. Marlowe sighed. There was yet some distance to go before reaching Gomfrey's shop. He pulled the edges of his waterlogged cloak closer around him, his thumb rubbing the inside of his ring finger. Normally, the signet ring was there, but he'd left it with Tamberlin as a keepsake. When he and Isabel had departed Philadelphia, he thought he returned to Tamberlin with a day's time. Instead, they'd both been trapped for months in the ancient world. Finally, he arrived at Market Street. At first light, vendors and marketers would flood the square, haggling over fish and vegetables, but at this hour, the place was peaceful. Marlowe ducked down an alley and slipped into the unlocked back door of Gompfrey's shop. The old man sat in a chair by the dying fire, his bearded chin resting on his chest. At Marlowe's entrance, he looked up and blinked. At last, Gompfrey's voice with a welcome rumble. Come, lad, let us stoke this fire. You must tell me everything. The old apothe apothecary rose, his hat askew, and Marlowe doffed his cape before embracing his friend and ally. Master Gompfrey, well met. Marlowe didn't speak again until he'd gathered wood from outside the door and helped himself to Gomfrey's stash of bread and ale. The two men sat before the hearth. The older man, gifted, a gifted conjurer and the only person from Marlowe's time to know of his abilities, waited patiently for the younger man to eat and drink before starting his tale. 
this journey, I was fortunate to see her. My Tamberlin, she is well. Marlowe's smile was brilliant as he recalled her dark eyes on him, their last moment together. And the task of controlling this destiny of yours? You've heard me mention Isabel, her sister, the scientist. My friend Volpe and she seek a solution to my random travels through time. Together, Isabel and I travel to the world of ancients in pursuit of some talisman or lost line of text, and we were caught up. How long was I gone from here? Nearly a month has passed. Marlowe pursed his lips. My time away from this place is getting longer and longer. Comfrey smiled. Pray tell, what is amusing about that? Marlowe asked. Do not take offense. The firelight burnished Godfrey's white beard into a snowy luster. It is merely that as your priorities shift, your attention shifts as well. This place, as you say, it used to be home to you. As you make more and more ties with the future and this last, Tamberlin, your intention changes. That place becomes home, your anchor in time, and this place is temporary. Do you see? A log dropped and hissed into the fire. Of course, Godfrey was right. Truly, Marlowe's focus was always with Tamberlin, the memories of her and her strange time of fast-moving vehicles and newfangled gadgets. He didn't care about the trappings of her world. He'd want to be with her in any time or place. Did you find such a talisman? Comfrey asked. Marlowe dropped his head in weariness and defeat. Alas, we failed. I fear there is naught to be done for me. I only hope that Isabel made her escape and returned safely to her own time. It is my wish as well. Clearly, these two sisters have found a place in your heart. I am most glad to see thee, Kit Marlowe, but take heart. I will be happiest when you are back in your rightful place, your new home, be it years hence. A single candle created flickering shadows across the dim shop. The hearth flames sparked as they devoured a dry branch, illuminating the men's features for a moment. Godfrey hugged himself against the sudden chill. He crossed his legs under the log robes he wore to stave off the shivers of ague. Marlowe often brought quinine from his travels to help with the symptoms, and he felt a twinge of guilt now that he'd come home empty-handed. What news of London? You have arrived at a most dangerous time, kid, Comfrey said, sitting back and scratching his beard. Much talk of playwrights and seditionists, hedonistic players and blasphemers. Dr. Marlowe's nonchalant shrug, he continued. Your patron has found himself at odds in Parliament. His proposal regarding foreign merchants and tradesmen caused a great deal of controversy. Angry demonstrations and declarations. One such protest implicated you as its author. Indeed, tis the talk of the Strand. The proclamation was posted on the doors of the Dutch church. I've been away. How does this impugn my good name? Marlowe asked over a yawn. Godfrey made an impatient noise. Only I know exactly how far away how far away you have traveled, lad. Others do not. Not your theater owners, nor players, nor compatriots. And most certainly not Thomas Wallisingham. Marlowe scoffed. He is my patron, not my keeper. And what does he have to do with this business of the Dutch church? As I said, he is the center of much strife in Parliament. It would behoove him to shift that focus to someone else. Implicating thee would be a small matter. I cannot quote the writing directly except for the last lines. We'll cut your throats and your temples praying. Not Paris massacre so much blood did spill. And it was signed, Tamburlaine. Gomfrey rubbed his snarled fingers before settling them in his lap. Clearly, you are the inspiration for such writing. Marlowe sighed. He'd written a play called The Massacre at Paris, and Tamburlaine was the title character of his work, Tamburlaine the Great. The name was thought to be from a Turkish re reg regent, but it came from a promise kept to Tamburlaine of paying her homage when he returned home. The play had been his most successful work to date. He stretched his legs closer to the fire. I am well used to such charges from those of a higher class but lesser intelligence. The rumors will prove fruitless like those in the past. I have not read this document, but judging from this last line alone, the author is obviously lacking in wit. The old man's bushy eyebrows raised up on his high forehead. Your strong opinions are well known, making you an easy scapegoat. Mayhap a direct disclosure with Walsingham is warranted. But that is anon. Tonight, please use the cot in the back room for your rest. Gomfrey gave a yawn and rose shakily from his chair. Getting halfway up, he seemed to recall something and sat back down. Not three days yawn, your former roommate Thomas Kidd was arrested and taken to the tower. At the mention of Kidd, Marlowe sat up. Thomas Kidd is in the tower? Pray tell for what crime. He stood and reached a hand down to help Gomfrey to his feet. 
They found seditious writings in kids' rooms. They say he gave up your name under the rack. After the elder man had gone up to his sleeping loft, Marlow lay down on the narrow cot. He stared at the firelight, feeling the ache in his bones, the soreness of his muscles. He was truly weary of fighting evil, of traveling to unknown times, only to come back to London and scrape by on the pittance his writings earned. He could not stand idle with this dark and dangerous rumor circulated. His mind would not settle. Too many thoughts of Walsingham and then this news of Kidd. The previous year, he had roomed with Thomas Kidd, a writer of some rank. The two had not gotten along. Their personalities were too different. While Marlowe had not seen nor heard from Kidd in almost a year, he did not wish the man ill. Nor did he wish to share his fate. <laughs>